Well, uh, I guess that's our signal that we can begin, right, Karis? Uh, I'm Larry Diamond. I'm a, a senior fellow here at the Hoover Institution and also at the Freeman Spogley Institute for International Studies. It's my great pleasure to um, be co-chairing for some time now this program on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region with Admiral Jim Ellis. Um, who's been our, our partner in building out this program and continuing to engage Taiwan and who co-led uh, our delegation uh, to Taiwan in August uh, of 2022 as the horizon of the January 2024 elections in Taiwan began to loom and to have with us um, our manager uh, and research fellow uh, in the uh, uh, project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region, namely uh, Karis Templeman. Karis uh, is a political scientist, a comparativist, um, whose research and writing is fo focused principally on Taiwan politics, but also on democratization, elections and election management, party system development and politics and security issues in Pacific Asia. Uh, we've now co-edited together two books um, with the late Yun Han Chu on the presidential administrations of um, Chen Shui Bian and then Ma Ying Zhou. And now that Tsai Ing-wen uh, is soon <laughs> going to be an ex-president Karis, we've got to roll up our sleeves and think about the third volume in that sequence. Uh, but anyway, Cars, it's great to have you with us. Our second speaker will be Stephen Tan. He's Managing Director of International Policy Advisory Group, which is a Taipei-based uh, consulting firm, which provides its corporate clients with solutions to issues relating to geopolitical risks, strategic planning on supply chain, which, as you know, Stephen, we did a lot of thinking about when we produced our recent report on the global trade in semiconductor silicon shield, regulatory policy, government relations, and, and so on. He was president of the Cross-Trade Policy Association for six years, a visiting fellow at Brookings, a partner of Baker McKenzie, a previous board member of the American Chamber of Commerce, Taiwan, and although, Stephen, you can't be with us in person, we see you very clearly. I'm sure we'll hear you very clearly, and it's our honor to have you with us. And then our third speaker uh, is a PhD candidate uh, in applied physics at Stanford. So maybe you're gonna give us some more scientific analysis <laughs> of this election. She, she is Tiffany chun An Wong. Her research interests focus on novel material synthesis for electronics and energy applications. And to even read that sentence <laughs> in our uh, one of our gatherings on Taiwan is itself a novel experience. <laughs> she currently serves on the board of directors of the North America Taiwanese Engineering and Science Association and was the president of the Stanford Taiwanese Student Association and I think it's probably more in those capacities that she's joining us here uh, to speak today. If I may, I'd also like to uh, introduce a longtime friend of mine who has the distinction of being the only person in this room who's actually been democratically elected as a president of a country. So we have the former president of Mongolia, Albig Dorch here. Um, he's someone who's actually had to face the challenge as the president of a democratically elected country of dealing with a neighbor like the People's Republic of China. Uh, and I know he's very interested um, in the democratic politics of Taiwan because he frequently asks um, very insightful questions about it. And I'm sure he will today. So um, how long did we say each of the speakers would speak, Cars? 10 to 12. OK. Well, you're going first, yeah, so you be so a good citizen <laughs> and set the model, and then we'll turn to Stephen, and then we'll turn to Tiffany, and then we'll 
I, I may add a couple of thoughts or reflections and we'll open it up. Okay. Go ahead. That's great. All right. Um, so thanks everybody online and in person for joining us today. Um, I should note all three of us uh, and Stephen, in fact, uh, were in Taiwan during the election, uh, the, the run up and uh, the day of the election. And so some of my remarks and our, our my colleagues remarks will uh, draw on some firsthand experience being there. Um, uh, my role today is just to kind of set the stage and make sure everybody understands what happened in Taiwan uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, so first off, let me just uh, uh, talk briefly about what was at stake in this election. The election was Saturday, January 13th, uh, and it decided who both the next president of the Republic of China on Taiwan would be and uh, the legislature. Um, they're both elected at the same time for a four year term. Taiwan has a unicameral legislature with 113 seats up, up for stake, uh, and uh, they're elected at the same time, serve a similar term. Um, uh, in 2020, uh, the last time this happens, uh, the Democratic Progressive Party, or the more China skeptical party uh, on the political spectrum, uh, retained the presidency when Tsai Ing-wen, the incumbent president, was reelected, and she defeated a KMT challenger. Um, this time around, she's term limited out. And so uh, her vice president, Lai Qingde, was nominated by the DPP uh, to be uh, her uh, successor. Uh, and so the DPP was vying for a third consecutive term in office. Uh, and this is, as we know from our own country, kind of a sneaky hard thing for a ruling party to pull off, uh, this transition from one president to another. Uh, and to win three consecutive terms in a row. Uh, and this race was complicated a little bit by uh, the fact that there was not only a KMT challenger, but a third party challenger, Coenja. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the presidential candidates here. Uh, first off, Lai Qingde, who's the sitting vice president, a uh, longtime DPP member, um, came up through uh, local politics in Taiwan as the mayor of Tainan and then became premier under Tsai. Um, he faced off against uh, the KMT's nominee, Ho Yu Yi, uh, who is uh, the current mayor of New Taipei City, which is the most populous municipality in Taiwan. Uh, and then uh, we had a third party candidate, Ko Wenja, who's the former mayor of Taipei uh, and also the founder and key figure in uh, the Taiwan People's Party, um, or Min Zhong Dang in Chinese. Uh, and um, he was very clearly angling to try to place himself between uh, Lai and Ho on a lot of different issues. So he was uh, deliberately running a kind of centrist campaign. Um, I think this audience probably knows uh, the DPP is the more skeptical party in the spectrum here. The KMT is the more China friendly party. And Ko Wenja is uh, somewhere in between those two. Uh, it was never very clear how far to the, the green left or the blue right he uh, would ultimately be. Uh, but at one point he actually flirted with the idea of a joint KMT TPP ticket. And so, although he started out his career closer to the green end of the spectrum, he's really drifted more towards the blue end um, in recent years. Um, Major issues in the campaign, uh, the issue that most uh, foreign observers focus on is the relationship with the People's Republic of China across the strait. Uh, this campaign was no different. That was an important issue. Uh, notably, however, all three candidates actually converged on a lot of issues related to cross-strait relations and defense and security issues. And so Ho Yu, for instance, as the, although he was the candidate of the KMT, actually uh, visited the US and sounded quite hawkish on uh, relations with China and emphasized his own party's willingness to support increases in the defense budget and to maintain uh, at least a one-year conscription requirement. Um, on the DPP side, Lai Qingde uh, pledged to follow Tsai Ing-wen's very moderate path in cross-strait relations as well. And so uh, both candidates kind of converged and were arguing arguing about very small differences in their cross-strait policy. And then Ko Wenja one day would sound a lot like Lai Qingde and the next day would sound a lot like Ho Yu Yi. Uh, and so he was uh, kind of trying to move between the two within a very narrow band. <clears throat> um, 
Uh, another issue that came up repeatedly in the campaign was uh, the uh, uh, co quality of life, cost of living, and job opportunity issues. Um, so Taiwan has soaring housing costs right now, but uh, has not had uh, significant increases in the median wage that uh, have so that those increases have not kept pace with the rising cost of living. Uh, and so increasingly, especially among younger people, uh, those under 40, uh, the, the burden of trying to buy a house and start a family and move out uh, of the place where you grew up uh, has become greater and greater. Uh, and that is contributing to a lot of kind of youth discontent with both of the major uh, political parties in Taiwan. Uh, so this was a major issue in the campaign. Uh, the All three candidates pledged to do more to support uh, families, uh, people with young children, uh, to raise the minimum wage uh, by a little to a lot, um, and otherwise try to provide more support for uh, people at the lower end of the income spectrum. <clears throat> uh, third issue, um, ultimately this didn't uh, end up affecting the vote too much, I think, but earlier in the year, Taiwan was actually technically in a recession. And so that's not a fun place to be if you're an incumbent party asking for a third term from the voters. Uh, and I do think the DPP's uh, prospects were hurt a little bit by this uh, downturn earlier in the year. Don't show that to Biden. <laughs> Um, the last uh, major issue that bubbled up uh, that I, I think was probably uh, I, where there was some difference actually between the candidates uh, was uh, on energy issues. Um, both the TPP and KMT candidates uh, vowed to extend the life of Taiwan's remaining nuclear plants. The DPP has long uh, taken an anti-nuclear stance and has uh, uh, been shutting down Taiwan's nuclear plants as they reach the end of their um, expected lifespan. Uh, and that's created a kind of energy and electricity crunch in Taiwan. And so there's a, uh, a heated debate about uh, what's the best way to transition to um, greener sources of energy without hurting Taiwan's overall economic competitiveness um, and without uh, becoming increasingly dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, and so that issue did come up uh, consistently in the campaign as well. Um, but overall, uh, I have to say, I've been in Taiwan for four different presidential election cycles now in 2008, 2016, 20, and uh, 2024. And this one was by far the quietest, I thought. Um, there was not a kind of polarizing candidate in the race, unlike 2020. Uh, that it did not feel like a, just a decisive referendum on the Tsai era, unlike, say, 2008 with Chen Shui-bian or 2016 with Ma Yingzhou. Uh, and a lot of voters, when you talk to them, didn't see a whole lot of difference between the major candidates. Uh, and uh, in some cases, uh, we're talking about just not voting at all, or we're, we're just disinterested in this. Um, and so the contrast between the way it felt on the ground in Taiwan and the way it was framed by the foreign media coming to Taiwan was really stark. Um, there were about 500 reporters on the ground uh, from outside of Taiwan and their editors back in their home uh, bureaus were all pushing them to frame this as Taiwan's existential choice. Um, this may determine the fate of Taiwan going forward. This may determine Taiwan's, um, the, you know, the, the fate of its democracy. Is going to declare independence? <laughs> Is Lai going to declare independence? And actually, on the ground, most Taiwanese did not uh, kind of buy into that framing at all. <clears throat> um, then uh, another curious thing about this election was that the polls uh, were actually pretty stable for months. If you looked... Uh, Back in July of last year, once the candidates were decided, um, Lai Qingda was clearly in the lead then. Uh, the polls were showing him pulling anywhere from 35 to 40 percent of the vote. In the end, he got 40 percent of the vote. Uh, so you could have predicted with a high degree of accuracy who was going to win this election six months ago. Uh, and the real question was whether uh, Ke Wenja and the KMT's Ho Yi would actually team up on the same ticket or not. Um, the real only significant movement in the polls uh, came right around the registration deadline when they actually declared that they did 
they were going to run a joint ticket. And then in a couple of days, that fell apart and they declared that they weren't and were going to run separate campaigns. And so um, from that point forward, we clearly had a three three candidate race with Lai in the lead, Ho Yi second, and Ko Wenja third. Uh, and that's actually how it ended up on election day. Um, so let me just show you the results. Uh, and I'll put this in some comparative or some some uh, um, uh, some kind of context uh, with previous elections. So in 2016, the DPP won a very large win, uh, a very large victory um, with over 56% of the vote. In 2020, Tsai Ing-wen won re-election with 57% of the vote. In 2024, uh, Lai won, uh, but with only 40% of the vote. Uh, so he was down 17 points from where Tsai Ing-wen was in uh, 2020. Uh, the KMT uh, hasn't broken 40% uh, since 2012, uh, so it's been a long time since the KMT has actually won a majority of the vote in a presidential race, uh, and uh, this election was no different. They were down um, at less than 34% of the vote, uh, and the big story, the new thing on the new kind of person on the scene here is Ko Wenja and his Taiwan People's Party, which did manage to win over a quarter of the vote uh, as a first time candidate, which uh, in Taiwan, uh, by historical standards, is, is quite impressive for Taiwan. Um, the other uh, elections were for the legislature. Uh, here, uh, some context, the DPP actually had a majority going into this election cycle. Uh, they had won uh, about 53% of the seats in 2020. That was down from 2016, but they held the majority. Um, this time around, they had a lot of uh, vulnerable incumbents uh, in districts, especially in central and northern Taiwan. The KMT is no longer very competitive in southern Taiwan. And it's just uh, when you go through race by race, it's kind of a wasteland for them. They really they, they didn't win a single seat south of uh, Jiayi. Um, uh, but in central and northern Taiwan, they were competitive. And in fact, they picked off uh, over a dozen uh, DPP incumbents um, in northern and central Taiwan, ultimately, including, um, uh, I would say, a friend and, and uh, certainly an acquaintance of ours uh, of this program, Lo Zhe Zheng, who's running in a difficult district uh, in New he Taipei. Lost. He lost. Yeah. Um, there is also a question about KMT TPP coordination. Uh, the KMT struck a deal with the TPP to yield a couple of seats in the districts uh, in return for the TPP not running candidates anywhere else. That turned out to be a really good deal for the KMT because they yielded unwinnable seats. Um, and uh, in the rest of the seats, the KMT candidate won um, uh, the, the competitive seats that the KMT candidate won, they won in part because there wasn't a TPP candidate around to split the vote. Um, uh, the KMT actually, uh, despite uh, kind of narratives about the KMT's long-term decline, the KMT still has a lot of uh, talent at local levels uh, and ran what I thought were some pretty decent challengers in competitive districts to the point where they did knock off a, a significant number of incumbents, including... Um, uh, Gao Jia Yu in uh, Taipei City. She went. She lost to a, a KMT councillor. It was a challenger there. Um, and then finally, uh, small parties in the last two election cycles have made a lot of noise, uh, particularly on the party list. This time around, no party, no small party actually won a single seat. Uh, and so, um, the Shidai Liliang or New Power Party in particular uh, just fell flat in this election cycle, and it looks like they may be dead at this point. Um, so I'll go through this quickly, but there are three electoral tiers in Taiwan. Uh, there's the bulk of the seats, about two thirds are elected from single member districts. The DPP lost 10 of these. Uh, they dropped from 47 to 37. Uh, in the PR tier, uh, the DPP and the KMT both won 13 seats. They won exactly what they won four years ago. So there was very little change in the party list vote. Uh, the only big change was the new power party dropped out. They didn't cross the 5% threshold. And the Taiwan People's Party uh, increased their seats uh, from five to eight. Uh, so they improved quite a bit on their previous performance. 
And then in the indigenous seats, there are six of those. Uh, the DPP has traditionally not done well in these seats, but they now have two incumbents, one in uh, both the lowland and highland districts, and they held on to those two. And so there was no net change there. Um, so to give you an idea of what this means in uh, comparative context, in 2016, the DPP had a comfortable majority of 68 seats. In 2020, they were down to 61, but still had a majority. 2024, KMT is actually now the largest party in the legislature again. Uh, and the two nominal independent candidates up there are actually blue. So they will vote with the KMT most likely uh, on critical votes. And so the KMT effectively has a 54 seat um, plurality, but uh, the, critically the Taiwan People's Party is in the middle and is uh, everyone's preferred coalition partner. And so what the TPP decides to do will go a long way to, towards determining uh, how the legislature goes over the next four years. Um, uh, final takeaways on the legislative election, DPP has lost its majority. It will ha now have to build coalitions with either the KMT or the TPP to get stuff through the legislature. Um, the KMT is now the largest party. Uh, they have already put forward Han Guoyu, the uh, 2020 presidential nominee, as their choice for legislative speaker. Uh, they're trying to convince the TPP now to support Han Guoyu as uh, speaker in return for, I don't know what yet, but uh, there is some, some ongoing um, negotiations over that issue right now. Um, uh, the TPP obviously now holds the balance of power in the legislative yuan, uh, and there are some interesting incentives uh, that may pull this TPP in different directions. So there are a couple people who joined the TPP fairly recently from other parties. You note on the right there, that's Huang Guochang, who was a key figure within the new power party uh, in the last two election cycles. He's now part of the TPP. Uh, I think has uh, ambitions either to hold a, a role in the central government, uh, perhaps minister of justice, or to run for say mayor of Taipei or new Taipei in the future. And so his ambitions may come up against Ko Wenge's ambitions to run for president again in 2028. Uh, and so this is something to watch closely over the next couple of years. Um, uh, finally, I already noted this, but the new power party is shut out of the legislature. They're probably dead at this point. They got less than 3% of the party list vote. Um, and no other small parties, not even the Taiwan State Building Party, which was kind of the new hot thing on the block four years ago, uh, were even close to crossing the 5% threshold or to winning a district seat. Uh, and so we're really in an environment where there's the KMT, DPP, and TPP, and that's it uh, at the central government level. Um, final thought here, um, to me, the biggest surprise of this election was Ko Wenge's, uh, remarkably good performance. Uh, he, to my mind, represents something new in Taiwan politics. Uh, he did especially well among young people, among well-educated people, and among male voters. There is a significant gap between his support among male and female voters. Uh, and so it's important to understand what Ko's appeal was. Uh, to get a sense of where the TPP might be headed uh, and whether this is a uh, kind of uh, some, something unique to Ko Wenja himself or whether there's a, a broader movement afoot that will become a kind of permanent piece of the Taiwan uh, partisan landscape going forward. Um, so with that, I will stop and turn it over to our next speaker. Uh, thanks, Karis, and thanks for having me at the uh, Hoover Institute here. Uh, virtually. Congress, you, you made a, a great presentation laying out all the details. Uh, so just following you, I will just uh, say a few things about uh, how I reflect on the process and outcome of the election and focus on the few particular things, um, including the uh, perspective uh, governance and governance style of the president elect legend of. And uh, what many people have been very interested in learning uh, about COVID and TPP, and also some of the comments and thoughts on the perspective cross regulation. Um, with that, um, I think I agree, Harris, with you that the 
outcome of the election uh, is very predictable and not a surprise at all. Uh, a couple of days before the election, we actually um, ran a model for the last time on our prediction and forecast. And it turned out to be that um, it was, we, we were very, very close. Uh, we predicted 40% on uh, liking this vote, and that was actually exactly 40%. Um, Coenja, we, we predicted as uh, 23%, 23.5%, but Coenja got 26.5%, which is 3% higher than our forecast. And Ho Yu Yi, we predicted um, as uh, 37%, and he got 33.5%, which is 3.5% uh, lower than our prediction. And as far as the LY seats, that's also very well predicted. Um, with only a margin of two to three seats differential between the DPP and KMT. But you have to know that um, the vote differentials in at least five districts uh, between the DPP candidate and the uh, KMT candidates were within 5,000 votes. So, you know, within a, a, a margin of two to three seats, uh, a differential that with no party uh, could be able to get a majority and it will be somewhere between 50 to 54 seats. And then the outcome is very, very close to what we predicted earlier. Um, but primarily because of the fact that this is, I think this is one of the um, elections in the short democratic history of Taiwan that, you know, a couple of months before the election, uh, save for the the joint ticket, um, uh, you know, drama, everything was so well predicted, and and you know we we got data, so we got all the all the you know information that that's proven in the end to be quite correct, um, and, and partially because of the predict predictability, the process of the election was extremely smooth. On Monday, uh, January 15, uh, right after the date of the election, everything went back to normal and folks seemed to forget about what we just had a, a, a major general election over the past weekend. Um, and and I, I take it as a, a, a big success, you know, for, uh, for the democracy of Taiwan and for the Taiwan people. Um, and China is also relatively calm. I will we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so in terms of the governance, um, a lot of people um, between the date of election and now have been talking uh, a lot about that uh, Lai Chinda will be facing severe challenges on both domestic and foreign policy simply because of the fact that they the DPP in its third term um, does not control the LY. Um, uh, I would argue that yes and no, um, because I, I would say that uh, President Lag Lai Chinda has a lot to work indeed uh, to try to see the common grounds, but there are a lot. You know, healthcare reform, education reform, you know, infrastructure update, public safety, cybersecurity, resilience, just to name a few. There, there are lots of lots of things that both uh, KMT and uh, DPP, uh, TPP legislators will be on board um, with the uh, DPP's third administration under lie. Um, and, and even on the cross rate issues, all three major parties have more commonalities than differences. For example, all three parties endorse a concept of the uh, Republic of China as an independent sovereign state. And all three parties denounce the so-called one country, two system as proposed by Beijing. And all three parties agree on strengthening indigenous defense capabilities. Um, and the list can go on. So, so I, I think uh, they're more common than, than different that, you know, it takes a political uh, skills um, and some capital to put things together and to try to find a commonality 
Um, and on the from the political uh, tactics perspective, if you look at this landscape as Carl just laid out, uh, KMT now <laughs> get fifty two seats plus two independent blue leaning seats, um, but 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 those are very delicate and fragile. If, if, you, if, you, if you look into some of the legislators' background and all that, and you know that um, there would be some potential swing votes on some of the critical um, uh, uh, bills and, and, and very important policy platforms to pull through. Um, with DPP continues uh, to operate the executive branch of the central government, it is probable to get some of those, you know, swing votes from the brew camp for, for some of the, um, you know, critical bills in the upcoming session, but we'll see. But but they may not happen in the upcoming election of the speaker and vice chief speaker on February 1st. I would, I would predict that the, the votes for the speaker and vice chief speaker um, on February 1st would just go through the party line and and uh, TPP uh, may not just go uh, in alliance with either Brew Camp or the Green Camp. Um, so um, with with that, let's just talk about TPP a little bit. Um, uh, TPP itself uh, is is not a mature political party. Someone mentioned earlier it, that it's a, it's a one man party, it's a COVID just party. Well, after the election on January thirteenth, it may not be just a one man party, but it's a still a young, immature party. COVID just changes his mind from time to time, um, but he now knows that his growing constituents, which are mainly young voters, voters under forty would not allow his party to get too close to KMT, and it would not allow his party to go too close to China. So post-election, Kuwinger and his party, I would say, would start to turn back to be more greenish than bluish. Remember that when he started his political career, he was like deep blue and blue and then light blue and then light, uh, I'm sorry, deep green and then light green and then sort of light blue, sort of what it's called uh, the, the white power. But, but, but it's actually, it's, it's, it's centrist and then it's shifting towards left and towards um, uh, right, um, you know, conveniently from time to time until up to this point. I think he himself is debating as to whether he will be more at this juncture, shifting a little bit towards the the greenish, uh, which I predict he will. Um, plus, he's two main deputies, Huang uh, Zhenxian and Huang Guochang, as Carlos just mentioned, will very likely be running for a uh, Taipei city mayor in Taipei, new Taipei city mayor in 2026, uh, 2026, uh, 2026, that's right. And so his party wouldn't and shouldn't be getting too close to KMT for electoral reasons or concerns. Um, so so uh, with that tactical point of view, I would say that in terms of the governance of the um, DPP's third term under Lai Qingde. Um, there might be a way that he will be able to be on the case by case, issue by issue, bill by bill basis to work along with um, both Ke Wenzhe and his party and and some of the uh, KMT members to try to get things done, but we'll see. Um, on the cross trade issue, um, my my understanding is that Lai Qingde has no intention to deviate from President Tsai's policy platform on cross trade issues. He will follow the Republic of China's constitution, constitutional practices. 
and legal regulatory frameworks as guiding principles for cross-strait policy making. Um, so I believe during his tenure, there will be no um, constitutional amendments or any other legal amendments or policy directives that may be construed even implicitly to be moving towards digital independence. And on the other side of the street, uh, Beijing so far seems to be unusually restrained on Lai's election in DPP's third term. Um, first, um, liking this brief, uh, the, the, the brief remark in a very soft tone uh, in the international press conference on the evening of January 13, that seems to receive a preliminary welcome by Beijing. Um, and, this, and second, for the past few days, there appear to be some preliminary positive signs on Beijing's possible consideration for to resume the track 1.5, the track two dialogues with Taiwan think tankers and scholars. <sighs> And even considering uh, lifting some of the trade sanctions on out of coercion. If it is true, then that would be a great start to resume some effective communications, or at least some nice gestures between the two sides of the strait. Um, and as, as you all know, Washington continues to encourage cross strait dialogue without any political uh, precondition imposed. So I remain cautiously optimistic about the prospects of cross-strait relationship. Um, because both sides of the strait have sufficient incentives to de-escalate and to avoid a derail. And also Washington's one China policy continues to serve as a critical stabilizer in this region. So I do not foresee that the equilibrium change in the next couple of months. So I end uh, with a positive note here and looking forward to uh, take some of the questions. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, that's a lot to chew on, but uh, next we go to Tiffany. So um, thanks, Karis, and thanks, Larry, for having me here. So I have been asked to reflect on my personal experience of casting my vote and staying in Taiwan the week before and a few days after. Um, and so it may not be so structured and it is subjective to my personal experience and also as a part of the younger generation. The problem is that I hope my parents is not listening here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if dad, you're here, just say hi, <laughs> and I know you're here. But anyway, I will be honest on like what the younger generation sees about the election. So I think I will start with just the, so it's actually quite fun this year. Um, the, because Ko and Je or TPP is quite new. Um, so this year's election is no longer like the boring to rivalry type of competition. So there are something new to see. And I see that all the news media kind of in Taiwan is also finding this exciting. So the night before the election, my family and I were just watching TV and all of the channels, you know, you know like the channels in Taiwan, they have their kind of party um, alignment. So some channels we know in our DDP channels and some are more pro KMT, but the night before, the election, all channels were reporting on Koenja. So like he got a lot of media coverage. And I think that's kind of the most obvious reason is that this is something new and it would get attention. So media wants attention and the kind of the party alignment comes second. Um, so, and there are, I would say that's kind of a little shocking to us because we're fighting for the TV and then we just see Koenja everywhere. Uh, we don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, there's like no discussion on that. They were just quiet and watching TV. Um, and so the kind of some discussion between my family and I, so it crosses multiple generations. So I have some relatives in their 70s, 80s. My parents are in their 50s, 60s, and I'm in the 20s, I always say 20, 30 group. Um, and so the 
older, older generation, their argument is always like when I have dinner or lunch with them, they always say like, do you really want war? Like you guys are the generation are going to war. So like if you vote for anything non-KMT, you're going to war. Um, and that's, that argument is kind of as, kind of to us is as stale as Wang Guo Gan, like the Mang Guo Gan mm -hmm. statement that DPP has been selling. So for us, I think we really want to have a chance to focus more on what we can do rather than these kind of selling um, kind of fair type of argument. So I think this is one of the main reason why TPP is so popular um, now among the younger group, because I'm not judge, I'm not gonna say who I voted for. I'm not gonna make analysis. I'm just saying TPP can be perceived as a valid third option because they're not trying to sell this kind of fair thing. Um, and so one more thing I kind of noticed is that we have been voting more or less based on just like single issue voting. I'm not sure if this is kind of naturally the case or it has always been like this or it is for this year, but single issue voting has been kind of the way I'm voting for most presidential election, less so for Li Fa Yuan or um, Li Wei. But what is the single deciding factor and what each party represents kind of changes over time. And there are kind of different groups. I see there are one group who will, oh, the single issue is the party. So no matter what candidate, how terrible they are or how great they are, they'll just vote for the party. So the party is a single issue for them. Um, there are also another group where the, I think the majority is that the national security and national identity is the single issue. It's just based on your agreement, you will vote for the president that represents your belief. Um, so there are the dominating issue of service, national security and relationship with China. And then also for our age group is the housing right and then diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, it's, it's a big thing. And also the possibility of war. So we actually want to vote for someone who can start conversation and then de-escalate and also the future of Taiwan's development, like childcare support, new technology investment, those are also very concerned. So domestic issues matters more to voters who stayed in Taiwan and have been living in Taiwan, has no plan of living abroad. And so for me, I have been living in the US for quite an extended period of time. So for, I think my peers, we care, we naturally care more towards like Taiwan's place internationally. So we'll naturally pay attention to those issues. So um, those will be our kind of single issue to consider. And the in the past, we don't really have option choosing beyond that single issue for president um, because it's for, to be honest, for younger group, it's very, very hard for us to vote for KMT. It is very, very not appealing. So, but this year, uh, even though Cohen, as Kairos already mentioned, he has been kind of dancing on different arguments of his opinion on Taiwan's relationship with China and his plans forward. But that's also a good thing because he's ambiguous about it. So now he's acceptable for both sides. I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm just saying we always hope for the best. So we kind of just, okay, now because he's ambiguous, so we can accept him which is kind of weird, but he's ambiguous. So now we have a chance of moving on to the second issue, not no longer single issue. We can have, we can start voting for like other, based on other issues, let's say, I think housing right is definitely one of the biggest thing because KMT and DPP has been perceived um, as, I don't know why, but they are perceived as, and then that becomes a reality. They perceive as the kind of the cause for the rising housing market, they are like chao fang. I'm not sure what, how can I translate it? Chao fang is that you purchase a lot of property and then- There's no Yes. So they are often perceived as profiting from that. So um, TPP kind of grab that and then have tons of, I would say pretty good housing policies out on the table. So that's one thing that's appealing to the younger group. And okay, so there are two things that observe that are true across different generations, 
and across different parties. So one thing is uh, we kind of all question and dissatisfied, dissatisfied at why DPP holds the legis legislature and presidential like position for eight years and holds like the majority in legis legislature. And then it's there, I have not received any advertisement or information or analysis on what they have achieved with such big power. Like, so I'm not their like spokesperson, so I'm not gonna actively collect information to prove that they did achieve something, but just say I, as a voter, I'm not receiving or perceiving anything that's proving that they have achieved anything with such a big power. So that's kind of a bad thing for DPP. Like as a voter, I'm not completely rational, right? Like I, I, I perceive them as this, then naturally that's a big question mark among many of the voters. And this is true across DPP supporter, across KMT support. KMT supporter are so happy. Like they say, hey, eight years, they are not doing anything. So that's their main argument. And then for TPP supporters, this is also something that they kind of attack DPP on. And also the second thing is Xiao Mei Qing as a baby, Xiao Mei Qing as a person, everybody has good words to say about her, no matter which party they support, they think Xiao Mei Qing is a good, good person. Um, and I don't know if you, I don't know if you observed that this election has been portrayed as like the vice president election because the president is just so not fun. And then the vice president, president has a lot of personality um, nobody understand why Wu Xingying is a BP party. <laughs> We're just kind of puzzled. And then Xiao Mei Qing is great. And then Zhao Shao Kang has a TV show and he's on the TV show. He's like an actor ish. Mm -hmm. So he has a lot of personality. And then we perceive him a certain way that I'm not going to say which way, but he's like very perceived as a. Yeah, I'm not going to say what I perceive him as. But yeah, so. Um, yeah, so that's the two things I think that came across, kind of we all commonly accept. And I think lastly, I will touch on why TPP is so appealing among the young people. I think I already kind of mentioned it. First is the possibility of we, we now can vote beyond single issue. And the second is that Ko is controversial. Um, that makes him very popular because some people perceive him as the crazy person that can finally break the bureaucratic system and have some fresh air in the government. Um, and he always advertised as like Su Ren, Zheng Zhi, Zheng. Su Ren can be good as he advertised, like he, Su Ren will not be, Su Ren will be, as he said, less corrupt, like less corrupted and less bureaucratic. But that may not necessarily be true, but he said it. And that's his argument. And a lot of people like it. And then those who dislike him may, mainly is because his public statement on woman right, it sometimes come out as very, I guess, a misogynist. Sexist is the word. Sexist, <laughs> yes. And then that's really hard to accept as that like you have a person. Okay, I, I kind of, that's my personal opinion. And then his statement is ambiguous, contradicting, and also, uh, yeah, all of his, uh, the VP, both him and VP are kind of Suren like. So with all the above reason, a lot of the like Ke Wenzhe supporters, it, these kind of doesn't matter to them because we, we want a like new opportunity, like some somebody new in the government. I think that's a common feeling that's true, kind of worldwide-ish. Everybody wants some fresh air in the government. Um, so also I think I did a site, I just pulled out my Instagram and I noticed that Ke Wenzhe has 1.2 million followers on Instagram. Lai Qingde has uh, 203K and Hou Youyi only has 99K. So that kind of tells you like, I'm not saying, I'm, this doesn't necessarily in popularity, but it definitely means that Ko Wenzhe can get his message out much more easily and effectively. And then it's more received um, 
the young people can see what Cohen just says more easily than what like, I think does say. We almost never see what Hoi said on Facebook or Instagram. So I think Cohen to really strike the young people as more accessible and more transparent because his argument can be found on the internet and he has a YouTube channel that you can go watch. And if you just simply Google like Cohen just argument, uh, you can find many of like what his point on like more domestic issues. But if you Google Lai Ching the whole they are kind of, you can't really find that much on the internet. So the young people actually like this accessibility and transparency uh, of TPP. So I think I will leave it, leave it there. Uh, thank you. Okay, well, uh, Tiffany, if you uh, decide not to complete your physics PhD and want to come over to the political science department, <laughs> I think they will welcome you because uh, you gave a very astute analysis. Uh, I'd like to make a few comments of my own uh, just to kind of mix things up a little bit and uh, then we'll have a discussion. So I'll speak to about five points. Uh, the first one is um, uh, the margin of William Lai's victory. And here, Stephen, I'll put a different spin on things than you did and I'll very much welcome your reaction and insights uh, to what I'm going to say, uh, and different from what Kara said as well. So if you take the final uh, distribution that you showed, Kara, 28.5% for the DPP, sorry, 39.6%, what, what was it for the DPP? For the presidency? Yeah. Uh, it was 40.05. 40.05. Okay, and 28.5 and 18.9, something like that. Um, and the final, uh, 40, where they wound up. Yeah, it was 40, 34, um, 26, roughly. That's not what I got from your figures. Um, in any case, um, we'll go back, or you might want to go back. Um, it looked like, um, the DPP was going to win in a landslide. Uh, why don't you go back and show the last public opinion poll ah, that okay. you showed, not the, not the final result. Right. So leave that up. That, if you okay. take 39.6, and that was the last public opinion poll, because there's a moratorium on polling in the last 10 days, that adds up to 87%. Then if you do what pollsters typically do, you know, it's an assumption that could be wrong, but you kind of redistribute the 13% who said they haven't decided or more likely won't say, you know, more or less equally among the candidates, you wind up with lie at 45.5, um, KMT at 32.7, and uh, TPP at 21.7. Now, I have a couple points here. One is that, uh, you know, obviously the race narrowed at the end. That's what I'm going to say. Mm. That's what I am saying right now, number one. This is my sense of things. It was the sense of a lot of political scientists uh, I talked to. We actually, we had a pool over lunch. Nobody put any money in it. But, you know, the expectation was this was a very close race. Uh, the predictions were among, I think, informed political scientists in Taiwan that Lai would get somewhere between 36 and 40 percent of the vote. Uh, but the only person at the table who thought he'd win by as much as four percentage points was, and this is not unusual, by the way, the one person at the table who was re representing a, po a point of view that was not a political science point of view but the opinion of a, biz a prominent businessman in the country. So it was the businessman, this probably won't surprise you, Stephen, that anticipated the result better than the political scientist. Um, <laughs> but my second point is, um, after the election, someone, I can't say who, I can't say what organization, shared with me a daily, a daily tracking poll uh, of a, a three-day rolling average uh, of the polling, 
which they were doing in the last 10 days, which couldn't be publicized because it was against the law. And this showed the race narrowing very dramatically uh, and then a widening again in the last few days. Now, here's what I'm going to say. This may be very controversial. I'm going to say it without comment. I'll leave it to others to comment. Two things happened in the last few days of the campaign, uh, and this tracking poll showed definite movement the day after each of these two things happened and in the days that followed. On Tuesday, uh, what was it, January 8th? Because uh, I think it was the first day, or January 9th, because it was my first full day there. My phone starts ringing off the hook. You know what I'm talking about. And when my phone starts ringing off the hook, the hotel phone starts ringing as well. And not just ringing, but screaming. And then I look at my phone and I see a message saying, missile flying over Taiwan uh, from PRC, use your discretion as to what to do. It was January 9th. Okay, January 9th, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, maybe, whatever. <laughs> and um, it was January 9th. And, um, you know, kind of duck for cover if you think you may need to. Uh, and later, much later, it turns out it was a satellite flying over the island, not a missile. And um, potentially an innocent mistake. Uh, I will tell you the opposition, the political opposition in the country feels it wasn't a coincidence. Uh, and there is some evidence from the tracking poll that um, there may have been some voters for whom the cross strait issue had a little more salience who might have been swayed by that. Anyway, there was a- Swayed which way though? To the DPP. To the DPP. Oh yeah. Uh, un unmistakably. Okay. Two days later, uh, uh, January 11th, the former president of Taiwan, Ma Ying Zhou, uh, has an interview with Deutsche Welle. Uh, goes fairly well. Mr. President, I think you know how traps can be laid by journalists. Uh, <laughs> and at the end of the interview, the Deutsche Welle um, uh, interviewer asked the former president something like, you probably, each of you know the exact language of the, of the interview. Well, you know, how can there really be negotiations? The two sides don't trust one another. And President Ma says, well, if you're going to have negotiations, they have to be based on, based on trust. And do you know the exact language? It was something like, we need to trust President Xi. It was some yeah. reference by President Ma to saying that, you know, there would need, you need to trust President Xi. And out goes another two percentage points in the tracking poll of support for the KMT. So, you know, I think this is a plausible explanation, you know, at least from one perspective as to why lie won by six percentage points. Uh, in the margin between the DPP and the KMT, rather than the two percentage points that at least many people I was talking to um, were predicting. Second, why did the DPP not do better? I think you all, particularly Kara, spoke to that very well. I, I just want to underscore two uh, points. One is, you know, it's kind of unusual across presidential democracies uh, with a two-term limit for a ruling party to win a third consecutive term. It rarely happens in the United States. Uh, it rarely happens in Brazil. Uh, and, um, you know, it wasn't generically kind of widely expected in Taiwan. It's never happened in Taiwan since it became... So there's a natural cycle that, you know, you would have expected all of the things being equal... Uh, that it would lose. And as Kara said, and others, I think, mentioned as well, there really was no existential issue. The cross-strait issue didn't have the same salience. Um, and then uh, I want to say something about Co. Uh, and I try very hard to be nonpartisan. I'm saying this 
as a political scientist, I think Coenja meets the classic definition of a populist politician. Uh, and I'll just say it as a description in terms of his appeal being built heavily on personality uh, and uh, image making, his almost completely lacking a party organization around him, him being anti-institutionalist, uh, I don't think anti-democratic, but anti-institutionalist. And I will say in the interaction we had with him, you were there, Jim, having actually quite a lot of contempt for political parties as institutions in his view that you know a modern day political party could be run like a corporation. Beyond that, I didn't even know this until the end. Uh, I had no awareness of it all. But what Tiffany said kind of politely um, is a very um, present view among a lot of women in Taiwan that there's a long history of sexist statements by this man. And um, I actually went back and Googled this and I can't even repeat some of them. I, I certainly would be embarrassed to do so in this setting. So, you know, he's not, um, he's not a like alt-right or radical left. You know, the irony is he's a populist of the center. He's in the middle, but there's a lot of the character of pop populism. And so my final point now about policy challenges, which I think Stephen uh, spoke to um, very insightfully, and I'll just insightfully, I'll mention three bullet points and then we'll have about a half hour for discussion. On cross-strait relations, uh, the eye roll that I think Karis and I uh, go through is when uh, very thinly informed journalists and policy uh, you know, observers say, oh, is Taiwan going to declare uh, independence now that William Lai, um, who once said, you know, in my heart, I'm a worker for Taiwan Pragmatic independence. Pragmatic worker for Taiwan yeah, independence. Yeah, thank you. You know, now that William Lai has been elected, and, you know, the obvious answer is no. We've met this man. He's very intelligent. He's very prudent. I think He's been sobered by the progression of the challenges that Taiwan is facing. And as, as Stephen said, I, I really need to reiterate what Stephen said. Um, it is safe to assume that on Saturday night, October 13th, when William Lai walked out to the international media in the tent outside DPP headquarters and gave his acceptance speech to that throng of reporters before he then went out uh, and, and spoke to the much larger throng of DPP supporters and a few international observers that um, the army of Taiwan watchers, that is in terms of size uh, on the mainland, were watching every word and facial gesture. And um, I believe uh, that they were looking uh, for a few things, three in particular. Number one, that he would reaffirm the ROC constitution, his commitment to the ROC constitution. And as Stephen said, it's very important that he did that. I think you can look to him to do that again on May 20th when he's inaugurated. Number two, um, that he would reaffirm his commitment to the status quo, no changes. We're gonna do the same, you know, the, our posture will be the same. And he did that. And number three, that there wouldn't be anything else he said that would be demonstrably provocative. And, and there wasn't. And number four, you know, he did say, we're going to, I realize I only won 40% of the vote. We're going to broaden our government. My government will not be only made up of my party people. So one question I might pose to some of you is what does that mean? Is he going to try and form a coalition government? But 
the irony is that Taiwan has elected someone who I think most people assume is a little bit more pro-independence and less pragmatic than Tsai was, but Beijing expected him to win. Uh, he won. They're watching him very carefully. And if he sticks to this um, posture, I think Stephen is absolutely right. The irony is we may see some kind of decompression and opportunities for informal dialogue. And I think one reason why isn't generosity on the part of Beijing, but Xi Jinping has a lot of headaches now. You know, he doesn't need the Taiwan issue to be hot and front center right now. The second thing I want to say about, uh, I know one of Jim's favorite subjects, energy. Um, I think, uh, you know, if a presidential candidate um, had wanted to make an interesting statement and maybe a suicidal statement uh, in the election campaign, the way Walter Mondale said in 1984, uh, when he said, Philip, you'll remember this, um, everybody knows we're gonna have to uh, raise taxes. The difference between uh, President Reagan and myself is that he won't say it and I just said it. Um, and of course, I, Reagan didn't really, but then George Herbert Walker Bush did. Uh, but the point I'm making is, if, if you talk to experts, I, I will just say, everybody knows Taiwan just can't hold out against the possibility of a Chinese blockade if it closes down all of its remaining nuclear power plants. And, um, you know, nobody will say it, but I just said it. The third thing is about defense. Uh, this is my last policy issue that you can comment on. Uh, and that is that, um, well, Matt Ponger is going to produce, you know, release a book for us before too long. I mean, Taiwan isn't even close to being ready uh, to do what they need to do. Uh, and um, I think a lot of people who are close to the issues know it. And um, uh, again, most people won't say it because it's very difficult for the society to absorb. Uh, but, you know, uh, Xi Jinping is kind of backing off now because the economy is bad. He's got a lot of problems. You know, three or four years from now, he may not be backing off. So I'm going to give you each one or two minutes. That's all to just respond to anything, and then we'll have Q and A. Go ahead, Karis. Wow. <laughs> all right, that's a lot to chew on. Um, we'll just chew on some of it. Okay. Yeah, I guess. Uh, so let me let me take up this point about the the polls and how accurate they were in the last week when so there's a 10 day polling blackout in Taiwan, where people can poll privately but not publicly and um, there is a lot of private polling going on and you hear you know, people will pass along things they heard, you know, specific polls that a campaign did or a candidate did or a polling company, including this one that was continuing to do internal polling. Um, what was striking to me about that, though, was that uh, there wasn't a consistent pattern um, in those polls. And it may be because I was getting different, uh, different polls at different times, but um, some people were suggesting that uh, the, the race was narrowing in those 10 days, uh, but then I heard from other people that it was actually widening. So, um, uh, And who, who you heard it from might yes, be related. Might actually be, so I, I don't know. I need to think more about this. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you what I predicted, uh, given this and just uh, the last 10 days on the ground without seeing any additional polls. I thought Lai would win 40%. I thought... Uh, Ho would win 35%, and I thought Ke would win 25%. And the thing that surprised me was not that Lai was so far ahead of Ho, but that Ke had actually done better uh, than I had expected and, and appeared to hurt Ho more in the end. And I, I thought there was a lot of downside risk for Ke, actually, because of his, uh, who made up his voting base, right? It's young voters, it's kind of people who aren't, uh, 
completely committed to a political party who are kind of casual um yeah you, you know they they dabble in politics maybe or or uh or they're not paying much attention but cuz seems to be kind of new and exciting and different and so that's not the voting block you want to build a a movement on right they're they're when the going gets tough they just don't show up to the polls and so i was expecting him actually to underperform where the polls were showing him rather than overperform and i think he's significantly overperformed and so that to me is the the single biggest to the extent there wasn't a, a surprise at all that's the single biggest surprise and the one that i think we all need to chew on a little bit more okay steven uh okay well just um just a quick reaction on what larry just say that the uh, uh uh president mind just interview on the uh, uh the dw and also the alert that the defense uh department sent out um the there, there there is there is no proof because we haven't done an, an analysis and i haven't seen the exit polls and all that but um i've talked to um many people uh, right after elections on uh what would those impacts of those two incidents be uh in the next couple of days prior to the election uh, the coll collectively in, in which I agree that in terms of the uh, defense alert on the satellite, you know, slash missiles, um, I think that even out because there, there were some voters that go either way and then that doesn't seem to be uh, having, you know, uh, an impact either positively or negatively on either candidate. But uh, President Martin Joe's interview did seem to have an impact eroding Hoyo East, uh, some, of the, some of the Hoyo East voters. Um, but, but then those votes didn't seem to go back to Lai Chinde. That seems to go to Ke Wenzhou. Uh, and, and again, there's no proof that, but that seems to be uh, consistent uh, with the, the gaps, um, you know, or the surge in the next couple of days of Covid's vote, and and the decline in a few percentage point of uh, Hoyo Yi's vote. Um, the second point I like to make is that um, people talk about quote quote unquote coalition government, uh, whatever, whatever that means, uh, where, 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 whether that applies to Taiwan's uh, uh, presidential politics. Um, I would say that um, uh, Lai's administration tend to invite um, some of the uh, political figures, and he probably will, uh, uh, that are not that political, not that greenish, but may or may not be a party member of TPP or KMT. That seems to be the trend, and and he will probably be looking at that. But but that is by far, uh, you know, nothing to do with the party coalition or working with the TPP, and and TPP may not to uh, be able to form anything either alliance or otherwise uh, with the uh, the ruling party. And it seems to be that it will be more on the case by case, bill by bill basis as it moves along. But I, I would, as I just suggested that I think TPP going forward, at least in the next section of the legislative year or two, um, it would be very hard for TPP to go back to work with KMT. Um, the, uh, again, his constituents would not allow him to do that, and he has political, his party would have political agenda uh, in the next uh, two years, so that pretty much prohibit him from doing so, and, and also his, uh, his, his, his party members, the eight members of the legislative union, would probably not want to do that, but, but you know, we'll, we'll see, and, you know, maybe a couple months later, we'll have another a session of discussions like this and we can reflect on that. Thank you. Okay, Tiffany. Um, I think I have three quick 
um, comment on the first is the missile thing that on uh, I think the ninth yeah. January um, I was actually at Tanshui, which is near a military base. I was just having fun on the yeah, and then some message comes. So it's actually quite a scary experience, but I was immediately puzzled because the message was unclear. And so if there's any policymaker that's listening to this, I think if you were to send out any warnings, first, you shouldn't puzzle people who get the warnings. Like, what should I do? What am I going to do? And then the next thing I do is I try to Google where is the shelter, right? That's the natural thing that you would do. And, and then, you know, what comes up is that there are two restaurants named shelter. <laughs> There's no shelter. So like, I don't know what to do. Like, should I like, so I think it's very concerning that nobody's trained and then we have no basic idea or, or it can be a good thing because we are not actually under imminent like <clears throat> war threat. So I, it can be taken both sides, but I think I was immediately kind of, I think I'm, I'm a little concerned over this that if anything actually happens, we are underprepared in this sense that we don't know where to do and or what to do. The one an yan shi is like you pause everything for 10 minutes and people just stand there and the car stop and that's it. Like that's I don't think that's a sufficient yan shi. And I think the second thing is about the populist. Um, um, immediately after the election, there are a lot of Coinger supporter on the social media come out and say the election is stolen. Mm. Probably that sounds familiar to many of you. Um, but I that I'm a little I'm more it's kind of reassuring to see that that argument was immediately attacked by the majority that's on the internet because we use the kind of a very old voting way of like it's you have to physically be there to cast a paper vote. So there's no digital system and everybody can apply to be an observer at the polling station. So it's very, actually very, very hard to cheat on like the vote, the accounting, the vote, because uh, my friend actually did apply to be the observer. And then at each station, people will like raise the, your vote and then yell, like kind of yelled who, like who this vote voted for and everybody can see it. Mm -hmm. So it's like quite transparent. So it's very, actually very hard to fix. So. Most people in Taiwan know this, and even though there are some claim of, oh, the election is stolen, but it's not kind of gaining any momentum on the internet. So that's, that's I think, a good thing that it won't, that it's not going to be so disastrous, if, even if there's a populist kind of uh, movement. And the third thing is Taiwan's energy problem. That's kind of more related to my, my profession and what my research is on. Um, I think the short thing I can say is, DPP's go green, like energy policy, it's like, to be honest, kind of unrealistic because going green needs transition. It's not like I want to go green and I shut down all the nuclear plants and, and why is nuclear plants not green? But anyway, like you shut down all the nuclear plants and you're hoping that solar panel or other uh, renewable energy works, but it's not how it works. It takes some time to transition. I agree if the majority of the people don't trust nuclear energy, but you shouldn't shut down that quickly. You should just kind of plan it in a realistic way. And a lot of times I, when I kind of argue this with, with others, the counter argument I get is, oh, you want nuclear energy, then it, do you want nuclear waste at your home? Like if you support of nuclear energy, just put nuclear waste at your home that you should like, where, where's the nuclear waste gonna go? I think that's a very unhealthy kind of discussion. Like I agree that a lot of, the things still needs to be discussed, but there needs to be a discussion. And I hope that in the future, um, there can be more public discussion on these matters. Yeah. Great, okay, well, let's take a few questions. Uh, I will keep looking behind me, okay. We'll go with Francis and Keo and uh, raise your, I'm gonna ask the three of you to take notes on these questions and then answer the ones you, feel comfortable with Francis. So I want to pick up on two things that Tiffany raised um, in her comments. One, Tiffany, is your observation that for young people, it was refreshing to be more than a single issue voter and that you were observing that a lot of folks in your generation were motivated by DEI issues. So I wonder if you or other folks, Stephen Karras, if you have something to say on this point to elucidate 
what that would mean, issues of inclusion in a specifically Taiwanese context. And two, mostly directed at Tiffany, um, being a Taiwanese person who lives abroad, who went back to vote. Was it ever a question for you about whether you were going to make that journey? Or was it always in your mind that you were going to go and among your peer group of people you know of Taiwanese descent who are able to vote in the Silicon Valley area? Were you observing that this was an urgent election for people where many people felt motivated that they had to go over when they wouldn't have otherwise planned to? Um, and how many people in your peer group or folks that you know actually did make the 14 hour trip back to cast a ballot? Great, so keep those in mind, Kiel. Great, thank you for the very insightful, informative session. Um, so it's clear that the candidate stands on China, the cross-trade relationship has strong impact on this election. I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on uh, their relationships with the United States uh, and also Japan, if you could, because people in Japanese media are very excited that the winning ticket had two people who have very deep relationships with Japan. So if you could comment on those relationships and their impact on the election, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could explain the why the missile possibility and like the possibility of war might have swayed voters towards the DP DPP rather than towards the KMT, given their like friendlier stance on cross trade relations. Thank you again for this uh, great conversation. I was wondering if you felt the international coverage of this election was accurate and. Um, like how was this covered in the United States or in Europe? And do you think it reflected correctly um, what you presented here today? Great question. Okay, thank you. Any other questions uh, for our panelists? Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Um, <clears throat> can there be more uh, elucidation as to why the two minority parties were able to reach a mutually advantageous agreement on the legislative election, mm. and they were not able to reach a mutually <laughs> advantageous agreement on the presidential election. Yes. I mean, you could see. I look forward to the answer to that question. <laughs> okay, so um, I think we can now close with the answers to these four excellent questions. Why don't we go in reverse order, since uh, especially the first question was to you, or whatever you want to answer, Tiffany, but we'll start with you. So um, thank you, Francis, for the question. I guess I will go with the easiest one is that, so I booked my ticket actually, I think almost a year ahead because I already planned to vote. Um, this is for me. And then the majority, almost most of my friends went back to vote. So I would say it's a very high voting rate. And overall, I think this year was about 70% voting rate. We have always been kind of above 70. And then with, I think the Tsai Ing-wen's first got elected, it was 80 something percent. Um, so I, I would think everybody's still have hope and certain like still wants, still think that their vote can change something. So I think that's a good that's a good sign that people are still willing to go back to vote and make the trip. And I think your second question is DEI in Taiwan's context. So Xiao Meiqing has long been working in the DEI uh, for Taiwanese um, community. So she's very, very popular in terms of like, she's a woman and then she supports minority rights. She supports like the transgender and all those issues. Um, and I think if I say in the in the kind of the opposite point of view, like KMT candidates are very, very just they show no effort in their choosing of their president and VP and also their legis like how do you call it, the district legislator. They just show no effort in the Shen Chu Gong Bao. So we have like a physical prints of everybody's. Um, statements um, mailed to home and me and my mom kind of just go through all of them and they just show no effort on that. So I think in Taiwanese context first is definitely women's rights and then childcare support. Those issues, I think D 
DPP really did a good job on putting that on the table. So it's very kind of obvious. Um, yeah, and then I think some, I think I can answer the why missile doesn't push people to KMT, but to DPP part is that, okay, it's also very hard to answer. It just naturally- I don't think it's obvious. Yeah. I'll tell you what is the most interesting thing and maybe one of the more important things said in this session is that when that came, you didn't know where to go. Yes. That's kind of concerning. Mm -hmm. I think. And then when you Googled shelter, if I understood it, what came up was a couple of restaurants with yes. shelter in their names. So there needs to be some military reform and the civilian trainings. Or as Enoch Wu, Wu is doing, kind of more emergency preparedness. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think so far, who is on the table actively doing that is Wu Nong. Try to have a civilian first aid. I'm not making my comments on if that is effective or not, um, but he's like, on the table. If you like, kind of try to think who is advocating for training, I think it's Wu Nong. Um, and many of the KMT like the mainstream KMT kind of argument is more like, you don't want to kind of perturb the bully. You want to stay quiet, mm -hmm. but that's just not how, like if you are bullied in school and you stay quiet, you will be bullied forever. <laughs> that's not how things work. So it's kind of not an appealing argument. So I think naturally, even if not pushed to DPP, but definitely not pushed towards KMT. Well, I'll say again, Tiffany, I think you make a pretty good political scientist, <laughs> not only in comparative politics, but in international relations. Anyway, uh, Stephen, we'll turn to you. Uh, some, some of the uh, quick uh, reactions. Yeah. Um, Taiwan's relations with U.S. Uh, continue to be the most important relations. And I think... Uh, um, I like to think that, you know, I, I think it will be that uh, the case that under my administration, it will continue to be a, a very solid relationship. There are some issues that we have to iron out, but, but basically, uh, I don't see a major uh, deal or uh, change. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. You're fine. Yes. Uh, I don't see, I don't see any detour or change. Um, in terms of the Taiwan's relations with the U.S. Uh, under my administration, um, uh, the in terms of Taiwan's relations with Japan, the first the day right after the January 13 general election, the first international uh, uh, guest of honor that President elect uh, President elect Lai met up with uh, uh, was a high was a high level delegation from Japan. And that speaks for itself that like in the uh, put a lot of emphasis on the uh, Taiwan's relations uh, with with Japan. Uh, and and I, I think that would be one of the one of his turfs that uh, he, he is highly interested in uh, cultivating the relationship uh, with, with Japan. Um, the weather international coverage uh, is correct. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's correct or incorrect. I think this is historical that we have never experienced that many coverages or that many, uh, uh, you know, press or, or journalists from the international press being in Taiwan. And yeah. I won't, I won't name the names, but some of the major uh, 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 media that I met with, uh, they're, they're like easy a dozen to 20 people around the world of that news agency covering the Taiwan election. So you can imagine that you're like 30, 40, 50 uh, international uh, media covering there are, there are hundreds and hundreds of people working on that. Um, they have different angles and perspectives, understandably, but that, but that is because, you know, uh, it, the, the Taiwan is, is a, a, a very important stakeholder in the election uh, in Taiwan, the outcome of the election uh, in Taiwan 
have drawn the international attention. So from the international uh, media's perspective, I think it makes a lot of sense, although domestically, uh, you know, we see things from different uh, angles, but complementary to each other. Um, on the, uh, the uh, white coalition, I, I absolutely agree. If the two parties cannot agree with each other on one the single ticket prior to November 24th for the January 13th election, there will be zero chance, zero chance that they could be working together for the, for the February 1st election uh, for the speaker and the vice speaker. And in the next legislative session, I, I don't think uh, that coalition or that, that, that sort of alignments will be as firm as uh, a lot of uh, KMTers would expect it. Thank you. Okay, and Karis, we conclude with you. Um, so I'm going to jump around a little bit here. Um, let me start with the international coverage question. Um, I actually think, uh, so th there's a huge number of reporters who used to be in China who got kicked out and have relocated to Taiwan. Uh, and because they're now based there, they actually cover it much better yep. than they used to. Uh, so like in the past, reporters would parachute in from Beijing and cover this from a very kind of pro-Beijing frame, um, including reporters like at the New York Times. Uh, they're all kicked out of China now, and some of them are in Taipei. And let me just give a shout out to Chris Buckley, who's done a wonderful job yeah. kind of reorienting himself, learning about Taiwan and, and writing some really good stories on the ground that uh, don't kind of uh, include a lot of cliches uh, that, uh, and, and there's lots of other stories like that uh, of a reporter who was, you know, who, who knows China really well, speaks the language and then have relocated to Taiwan and, and are doing good work on the ground. I, I'd give another shout out to the Bloomberg uh, coverage of Taiwan. They had uh, long uh, profiles of all three of the presidential candidates that they spent months researching. Uh, they actually surged people into Taiwan a year before this election and invested a lot of resources to cover it really well. So to my mind, this was the best covered Taiwan election that I've ever seen in terms of English language media. Uh, but there's so much more out there that there were also still people parachuting in on election day or the week before and writing the cliched articles, you know, so you just have to know where to look. If you look at, for it, though, there's much more quality work on on this election. Um, on why the KMT and TPP were able to come to an agreement in the legislative races, but not the presidential race. A couple of things, the legislative races, the TPP didn't have candidates in most places. And so it was really easy for the KMT to say, we'll give you this seat and that seat. You do your best there, but don't run against us in other, other races. Uh, and the TPP was fine with that because uh, they didn't have a whole lot to, to give away there. Um, the problem with a presidential ticket is that the presidency is worth everything and the vice presidency is worth nothing. And so uh, both sides wanted the other side to, to go into the VP slot. Uh, and then you're just you're trapped as VP for four years. You can't really credibly commit to share power in that arrangement. Uh, and if somebody's appointed as premier, they could be fired a month. Exactly. Later. Right. Uh, and so I actually thought there was grounds for Coenja to make a deal where he didn't join the ticket, but supported it from outside and put himself at the top of the legislative list and then ended up as, say, speaker uh, or otherwise, you know, um, took advantage of the leverage he had over the KMT before the registration deadline and, and really extracted some credible promises from them. And he didn't do that. Uh, instead, he said, you know, we'll do this by polls. He was confident that he was ahead in the polls. I, looking at this, I don't think he was. I mean, this yeah. is in the, yeah. the period right before then. The KMT was pretty clearly ahead if you uh, had a, a trustable po pollster. And uh, and so then the, the polling agreement they worked out, uh, he was stunned when the results came out and he had lost. Uh, I think I'm a cynic. I think the KMT would never have signed on to anything where they would have lost the polling arrangement to decide their nominee. They wouldn't have, they would not have agreed to a deal that uh, Ho Yu Yi didn't make Ho Yu Yi the candidate. So I think Ke was just a little too confident, overconfident, and maybe 
you know, thought he was smarter than he actually was in this uh, arrangement. Uh, and so I thought he blew an opportunity really to, to leverage what he had over the KMT into more power. He could have gotten more seats and, and potentially been, you know, the speaker of the legislature, or at least have uh, some real commitments from the KMT going forward. Um, last thing I'll say is I'm, I'm not persuaded that the missile, uh, so-called missile test, um, actually helped the DPP when I saw that. And then when I heard the kind of conversations about that over the next day, the, the points that stuck with me were nobody knows what to do. The DPP has been talking about this stuff for eight years, but they have done zilch to actually prepare people. Do you want another four years of this? Or do you want to elect somebody who might actually deal with this set of challenges? Uh, so I didn't actually think it helped the DPP. And I thought if it were a deliberate signal that they were sending out they totally botched it um, well i certainly didn't mean to suggest <laughs> that. um uh Karis, uh stephen tiffany thank you all so much uh it's been a really rich discussion and you know what what can i say it was it's just a real privilege for uh international observers journalists friends to be able to watch another manifestation of this democracy it's however you you think about the issues or individual parties or candidates you know to see this election campaign unfold uh, go to the rallies people feel very even not quite as passionate as they used to feel but you know real passion about their parties and candidates and their banners and their mugs with the images and so on and then on the day of the election, the polls open at eight, uh, they close at four, everybody votes, nobody is suspicious. The ballot boxes are opened at four in exactly the way Tiffany des described in the old fashioned way. The ballots are, you know, shown up, counted, you know, uh, there's uh, X's or, or lines put on the chalkboard. The results are finished. Everybody agrees. They're phoned in. Four hours later, the result is announced. The losers concede. The winner accepts, and life goes on. Wouldn't that be nice in the United <laughs> States? Anyway, thank you all so much, and uh, to be continued. Thank you. Let me also just give a shout out to Stephen. He's in Spain right now, and oh, it's wow. two thirty in the morning, oh, so wow. he's really. <laughs> uh, burning the midnight oil here all right thank you thank you guys all right it's good to be here thanks Stephen. have a good all night right, get some rest all right all right bye-bye <laughs>